We're at like the second to last line on Pay Amid Aleph, 80 A4, the last paragraph. So again, we're talking about that. Uh, if, last week we were talking about if the husband, the husband has rights to the payrolls, to the stuff, the, the fruits or whatever that the field produces, the husband has the rights. And we said last week that even if the husband has to spend money to improve it, whether it's by fertilizing, I gave an example, maybe it was a swampy and he had to improve the drainage and this and that. Uh, uh, he, if he, he do, as long as he took any uh, payrolls from it, he doesn't get any money for the amount that he spent. So... Uh, so if a husband sold, so the husband does not own the field. The wife owns the field. He only owns the payrolls, the fruit or whatever that the, the field will develop. The question is, is he, does he have a right to sell the fruit? He clearly can't sell the field. If he sold the field, there's nothing. Does he have a right to sell the fruit that the field will, will grow? Me, I'm reading on my Dekani Acne. Do we say whatever he has, he's able to sell to someone else? Odilma ki Paris Labal, or maybe when the Chachamim uh, established the fact that the, the the fruit that the field grows goes to the husband as we turn to pay him a base, Mishum Rabach Beisa, is only that the house will have a little bit more food in it, because if he wouldn't have it, it wouldn't be in the household. So the fact that if the if if the uh, the field produces something, it's you know it's food in the pantry. Avolizibune lo, but they did not allow him to sell it. So those are the two sides of the question. Since he owns the fruit, is he allowed to sell it, or uh, the chachamim gave him uh, the fruit so that there's more food in the house, and he's not allowed to to uh, not let that food get to the house because if you'd sell it, he's Stopping it from going to the house. So Yehuda Mar Bar Marei Mar Mishmei De Rava Amar Masha Asoy Asoy Yehuda, the master son, or Yehuda Mar, the son of Marei Mar, in the name of Rava, said, "What happened happened." Meaning, if he sold it, uh, it is sold. Rapapa Amar Mishmei De Rava Lo Asav Al Kulom. Rapapa said the name of Rava. He did not sell it. He does not have the right to sell it. And both of them said in the name of Rava. So what's going on over here? That which Rabbi Yehuda Mar, the son of Maremar, said in the name of Rava, it wasn't explicitly said by Rava. He inferred it from a, a different halacha that Rava said, or from a, a, a situation that he observed by Rava. There was a certain woman who she got married, and into the into the marriage she brought two maidservants. Now, what where what what chumash do we know? I mean, what do we know from chumash? Who got married and brought a maid servant into the marriage? Oh. Yeah, Leah had uh, uh, Bilha, or had had uh, yeah had Bilha, and Le Leah had had Zilpa, and and Rachel had Bilha. Now it's true that. Uh, Sarah had a hugger, but that was given at uh, Avram and Sarah were already married at the time when they got a hugger, when Paro gave it to her. But yes, yeah, so we see. So in Tanakh, we have an example where a maidservant was given in with the marriage. So a certain woman brought in two maidservants into the marriage. So the the husband was able to get the 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 derivative benefit. Azal Gavra Nasavitzachrite. The man went and married a second wife, and so he gave the new wife one of these two servants to help her with her duties in the house. So the woman came in front of Rabbah for a din Torah to complain. She cried out that her husband was taking away her, her, her servant. Rabbah didn't pay any attention. So the one who saw this incident, which is Rehuda Barbara and Raymer, thought it's because whatever the, that the husband, what the husband did, took effect. Velohi, but that was not the reason that Rava didn't uh, that Rava ignored the woman. Mishum Ravach Besa, because Rava holds that the per, the reason that the husband gets the payros of the so in so in general we're talking about a field and the fruit that the field develops. Here, the maidservant is the 
the the principal and the work that she does in the house, cleaning up, cooking, that type of stuff. That's the payrolls. The the work that she does in the house is the payrolls. Mishum Rav Chabesa. So uh, Rava held that the reason that the Chachamim gave the husband the 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 payrolls that came from Malug principal is so that there'll be more stuff in the house. Uh, but here it's but here the more stuff is getting in the house, meaning it's not that there's more food in the house because this is a a, a maid servant who's doing chores around the house, this and that, but she's still doing chores in the house. So this this woman was upset that she's not able to boss her around anymore, but the other wife is also having this the the that maid servant do chores around the house. So the stuff in the house is getting done because of this uh this woman who is uh, who is like a nechse malog. So so uh, so the, the husband doesn't have a right to sell, but in this case, the husband reallocating the maid servant. To wife number two instead of wife number one, uh, the house is still benefiting from that maid servant because she's still doing chores and stuff around the house. The the halacha is that if the husband sold the peros, because obviously he can't sell the, the land itself because he doesn't own it, he but he only sold the the profit uh, the that which the land will develop. Halacha is it takes no effect. He does not own the rights of that to sell. My timer. What's the reason? So it's a little strange because the Gemara gave, uh, um, gave the swara of if he's allowed to sell it, excuse me, or not. And now it's saying, what's the reason? Well, it told us the reason because the husband doesn't have the right because it'll take away from Rabbi from either if it's literally produce in the house or we saw from this maidservant, um, The chores in the house getting done. So the Gemara says, excuse me, uh, Rabba Amar, excuse me, Abaye Amar, Cheshina Shema Tachsef. Abaye says maybe uh, the land is going to, the person who buys it isn't going to take care of it. Because uh, the person who bought it says, well, um, the the person who buys it isn't going to fertilize it because he says I don't own the the land itself I only own what comes out so maybe the husband is or whoever is gonna be able to take the the whole thing away from me so he's not gonna upkeep it uh, however if the husband would keep it the husband is, says well if my wife dies then I'm gonna be able to keep this land so I don't want it to deteriorate I want to keep it you know at least in in working order. Uh, Rava Amar Rava says Mishum Rebbech Beisa, but Rava says it's so that there's going to be more in the house, which is what we mentioned at the very top line of this Amud, uh, asking maybe that would be a reason that he he he's only he only owns it so that he has Rebbech Beisa, more in the house, and he doesn't have a right to to sell it. So my Beinayhu, what's a what are some situations where there will be okay according to Rava and not okay according to the Abaye or vice versa? If one problem is, one difference is if the land is close to the city. If it's close to the city, anyone could see it, uh, that if it's if it's uh, not being maintained. So if it's close to the city, that's an incentive that uh, the husband is going to keep it maintained. So that wouldn't be a problem according to Abai. But according to Rava, even though it's close to the city and he's going to maintain it, if he sells the rights, then he doesn't, it's, it's not going to be adding to the now, also, one thing here, we have another example, but um, you could say that, um, you might say that, well, if he sells it, why doesn't that money that he makes go into the, uh, the you know, the house fund? And wouldn't that be called Revach Beso? But it seems that in the time, so nowadays, you monetize anything. There's even uh, someone who was, uh, I know who was about, I don't know, it must have been before 2008, 2009, before the financial crisis. But this, the, I know I know a guy who at that time, his his the job that he was working at was giving people loans against their PSLs 
if they had season tickets with the PSL. Meaning you get a loan, it has to be secured by something. We have a, a car loan, it's secured against a car. You have a mortgage, it's secured against a house. So you needed money. What do you secure it against? His PSL. He he, uh, he bought money, for, owned a, a season ticket. They're taking. So nowadays we monetize everything. But in in uh, but in but in the time of the Gemara, if you would have sold it, that lump sum, he would do whatever he wants. They they didn't. I don't think they had the uh, accounting ideas or the bookkeeping ideas of it's going into the uh, the house fund. When you would have a field that was developing fruit, when it's harvest time, you or you would be able to th that would come into the house. But if you sold the money now, it's considered done. There's nothing else that's going to be done with that money. Obviously, he he could invest it. He could buy buy uh, you know buy something and try to sell it and this and that. But uh, it's not considered something's going to be coming into the household. Inami bal arasu. A different explanation is if the husband is a sharecropper for the person who had bought it. So in that case, so he, so because he works the fields, he's going to make sure that it's uh, well. So Rashi says. Because in that case, as a sharecropper, he gets a percentage of the crops. So even though he sold the main thing to someone else, but because that guy hires him as a sharecropper, he gets a big percent of, or significant percent of the crop. So the crop is going to go into the house. Arts girl seems to explain the opposite of what I just said. So according to what I said, uh, according to Rav, it's okay because the house is, get, is getting more stuff. But but uh, as he's only a sharecropper, he doesn't care about it being fertilized. I'm not sure exactly how that works. If it's on the owner of the field or the sharecropper. But Rashi says that if the husband is the sharecropper because... He's giving the payros. Uh, he's giving some a, a certain percentage of the payros to the to the other person, but he gets to keep some of it. So the way I understand Rashi, so then it's okay to Rava, even though he's not getting as much as he would have sold it. But according to Abaye, it's not going to get. Uh, it's not going to get upkept. Arts girl somehow says the opposite. The Arts girl says. Since the husband is in charge of the field, there's no reason for concern regarding the upkeep and maintenance. So Abai would permit the sale, but Rava would not permit it since the household does not receive the benefit of the property. But as an artist, he's, he's getting a percent. So I, I would say the opposite of what Irish Girl says in uh, note nine. Inami Zuzi Avid Buhu Iska. Or, this is what I said because I remember the Gemara. Or the difference would be if the husband takes the money and puts it into a fund that he's going to invest. And so uh, he's going to buy something and see if he could sell it and make a profit off of it. So in regard to upkeeping the property, it, the property is not going to get upkept. So he doesn't have a right to sell it if that's the issue. But if the issue is Revach Besa, according to Rava, because he is trying to profit by investing the money that he makes from it, it would be allowed to, uh, he would be allowed to sell it because he is going to try to make more money for the house. He's investing it in something. Mishnah. So what happens if a woman died? We learned in the previous parak, I think it was the previous parak, that a woman who dies and goes to Yibam, the her uh the original her original husband's estate would pay her the ksuva in case of of uh her husband dying or getting divorced. Uh but the question is here is What's the status of the nichse melug that she brought in? She brought into the first. Uh, she brought it into the first wedding, to the first marriage, and the the sec the brother didn't do yibum yet, so they have a connection, but they're not married. So since she's not married, does she have a right to sell this property or give it away? Because she's not actually married at this time. So what's the what's the halacha? So she so this is a case where she's waiting for yibum or chalitza. And at that time, somehow, maybe her father died or her mother died or whatever the situation was, and she inherited property. So right now, she's not married. She can't, she's not 
free agent to marry whoever she wants because she's she's a zakuka. There's a connection between her and her and her brother-in-law, the Yavam. So is 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 she allowed to sell those fields or give them away or not? So modem beishamba beitzol shemachers venosenes v'kayim. She's alive. Her brother, her husband died, but she didn't. But her brother-in-law didn't do yibum yet with her. And right now she inherits fields. It's not talking about fields that she brought into the her first wedding marriage. She didn't have those fields yet. But now that she's waiting for yibum or chalitza, let's say her father died and didn't have sons and had her, so she inherits her father. Is she allowed to sell the fields or not? So Beisham still agree that she's allowed to. To give it or sell it, and and uh, and what she did has legal effect. But if she died before the Yibum takes place, what happens with her Ksuva money and with the property that uh, that come and leave with her, meaning with the Nechse Malog? Beishamai says that the that the heirs of her husband and the heirs of her father, meaning her family, split it. Meaning some of it goes back to her family, and and some of it goes to. In this case, her husband I think means the uh, her first husband. Rashi points out that that it's not literally that the father's that her father's heirs and her husband's heirs split the ksuva. He says they split the land, but her hus her father has no share in the ksuva. The ksuva only the full value of the ksuva, the two hundred zuz or the one hundred zuz that goes to uh, her husband's heirs. says so what happens if she died having gotten property but um but uh the, before the Yibam took place the property stays with whoever owned them up until this point and the Ksuva is in the Chazaka, the assumed status of the heirs of her husband the the properties that she brings into the marriage but the husband doesn't own them. He only gets the payros, the, the, the stuff we're talking about in this chapter. They stay in the chazaka of the heirs of her father. So Beis, so Beis uh, Hillel says that there's three different... Uh, so that, that if there's property that she brought in, but that that was given Nichtse Ton Barzal, the iron sheep, that goes to the husband, so then the husband's heirs would keep the, those lands. Whereas, according to Beishamai, it seems all the all the fields would get split. What happened if the brother who died had he had money in his bank account when he died? So you look up him karka. So he should buy land with it, and he can get the peros. So like we know from uh, when someone does yibum, they acquire the their brother's estate. But one of the things that the brother's estate owes is the potential future payment of the ksuva. If they would get divorced or he would die first, she would get the ksuva. And so if he would literally spend everything from his brother's estate, there's nothing from the brother's estate to pay the ksuva. And he doesn't have to pay the ksuva because he's assuming the marriage and the obligation of his late brother. So this... So therefore, he has to do something that uh, his brother's estate, his late brother's estate, will still have money in it for the ksuva, so he buys karka, so the value of that that real estate could go to pay the ksuva. But in the meantime, any fruit that grows on those lands, 
he has the right to benefit from. What if when he bought them, there's there's fruit that was picked, it was separated from the tree, but it's still on the tree. So, excuse me, if the brother, if the brother had this picked fruit, who does it belong to? So you look at him, Karka. So that's part of his estate, and he and the brother has to buy. The still alive brother has to buy Karka with it. The Hua Chaperos and the uh, the Yavam brother is allowed to have Paris from that land. I'm Chobar Karka. If when the when the first brother died, the tr the fruit the trees have fruit on them, but they weren't picked yet. So is that fr so? Remember, if you buy a field, it's worth a certain amount. If you see that the the fruits are already growing on the tree, the fruit the the food is worth the land is worth a little more because you know that you're going to be getting this fruit. It's because you see it already growing. It's it's not so far in the future. It, you just have to wait a little bit and you're going to get it. So it increases the value of the land. So that increase of the land is that from the is that is that part of the karka that the brother owns, or is it considered something else? We saw this in the previous mishnah. We discussed this. I'm Rabbi Mayor. We uh, we uh, appraise the land to see how much it's worth with this fruit that's growing right now. And how much it would have been worth if there wouldn't be fruit growing on the trees right now, or the or, or in the land because it could be grain maybe. But So the the difference between the two prices, he has to buy karka with it. So Rabbi Mayor holds that the fruit that's on the tree is as if it's a liquid asset. Like the brother left uh, 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 cash laying around. So according to Rabbi Mayer, the fruit that's already picked and separated from the ground has no halachic difference from the fruit that's still on the tree. The Chachamim Omer, but the Chachamim say, if the fruit is still is if the fruit is already growing on the trees, those fruit belong to the husband. He doesn't have to buy real estate to 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 pay the the wife's um suva with it and if the fruit that was already picked or they fell off themselves and it's still good fruit whoever takes it first meaning cut him who's if the husband collected those then it's his cut he but if she got it first if she collected it before the yavan brother-in-law so then it's considered uh uh liquid assets of the of the brother and he has to buy real estate with the value of those fruits and that land will be uh pledged towards paying the ksuva but the husband gets to use peros that the land that that land develops kinsa so once the yibum took place and the brother-in-law married his sister-in-law so now she's not his sister-in-law anymore. Now he's, she's his wife. She's fully his wife. She's his wife for all things. The only exception is that in case of divorce or his death, he he his estate doesn't pay the ksuva. His his late brother's estate pays the ksuva. He's not allowed to say, here, I, I'm putting aside money in case I die first or in case... We get divorced. This money is going to be for ksuva. You can't say that. But all of his assets are indebted or pledged for her ksuva. And similarly, a person can't say to his wife, meaning the only difference is this case was his yibum wife. And right now, this phrase in the Mishnah is talking about a regular wife. You can't say that I'm putting aside such and such money uh, for your ksuva. No, all of his property is indebted and pledged for the ksuva. What's one of the, the one reason for this is because um the reason that one of the reasons that the Chachamim made a ksuva or a set price on the ksuva is that it shouldn't be easy. A hu husband gets mad, he shouldn't just impetuous, impetuously divorce her. The fact that he has to pay her a significant amount of money is going to be a check on his behavior. 
So if he already has the money aside, her defense, the whole ksuba as a defense against her getting divorced, is blown up in smoke. It doesn't exist anymore. So that's one reason why he's not allowed to do that. Girsha, if he divorced her after the Yibum, Einla El Aksuva, she uh, only gets the original amount of the Ksuva. But the rest of the of her brother's estate is now uh, free for the brother to do what he wants to. Hechzira, but then if he remarries her, Hareu Kachal Anashem, Einla El Aksuva Bovat. She's like all of uh, like any other woman, and she only has the original ksuva. Meaning she's not going to get a ksuva a second time if they get divorced again. Well, let me be a little clear. If if they got divorced and he hadn't paid her ksuva yet, and then he remarries her, she doesn't get a ksuva from the first marriage and a ksuva from the second marriage. If he remarried her before he paid the ksuva, we say that whatever ksuva he promised her for the first wedding applies for the second wedding. So when we say ain't la ksuva bavad, she gets one ksuva, not a double ksuva. One for the first marriage and one for the second marriage. Even though the double, the second one would be a little bit less because she's not a basula anymore. But uh, if she was previously married for her first marriage to the this brother at least, so they would both be uh, 50 uh, uh, zuz, uh, ksuvas. If someone, a woman who's waiting Yibum or Chalitza died and uh, the her brother-in-law did not do Yibum or Chalitza for her, who has to bury her? Does it get paid from the first brother's estate or the second brother's estate? Do we say that um, the that the husband of the heirs of her of her husband because obviously if she's doing yibum she doesn't have any kids and he didn't have and uh he doesn't have any kids so so he doesn't have any heirs but it means his brother who's as close as there so uh do we say that her the yavam uh uh estate has or well he's alive so it's not his estate the yavam has to pay for uh for the funeral expenses because they have the obligations of the ksuva on her, and we learned before that uh, that um, the the husband has to pay a certain amount for a respectable funeral for his wife if she dies, and that's considered being paid from the ksuva. Or maybe her father's family, I meaning if her father is not alive, then her brothers would have to pay for a funeral because they are receiving the nichse malug back. This, these properties that's the subject of our parak, that these properties that belong to her and go back to her, and oh, the husband only has benefit from it. So, so because our Mishnah says that there's a there's a difference in uh, who gets to keep different parts of the ksuva, the the property stuff that was that the ownership was retained by the wife versus the money. So in this case where it's being split is the funeral expenses are they going to come from the the liquid portion of the ksuva and the, those yorshim or is it going to come from the property aspect which it will return to her her family's uh, uh ledger books amar of amram of amram says tashma learn from this brace at the tanya because we learned in the brace of shemer siyavim shemesa if a woman who is waiting for her brother-in-law to marry her as yibam died we turn to pay aleph amid aleph your her heirs, meaning the heirs of her ksuva, are obligated to bury her. So we see from this brisa that uh, the 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 yavams the yavam has to pay for her ksuva. It doesn't matter that she has land property going back to her family side. No, the uh, her uh, brother in law has to pay for funeral expenses. Um, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi says, Afna nami tanina. We actually learned this in a Mishnah. It's not just from this price, but there's a Mishnah later on in Ksuvos. A widow gets uh, fed and sustained from the property of the orphans, meaning she died, she had kids, she didn't need Yibam. So her husband's estate 
has to pay for her food. We learned stuff about that before, but the main mission is later on. And if she's still working, her the the amount that she goes goes to the estate. Now the estate now really is in the, in the control of her children. And again, this all applies until they decide to pay out the ksuva. We learned a few prakim ago uh, that I think we learned that at a certain time, the amount of the ksuva would be spent by the if they would be feeding her and taking care of her for many years. The Ain Chayavin Bikfurasa, and they are not obligated to bury her. Yorsha, Yorsha Ksuvasa, Chayavin Bikfurasa. Her heirs who who inherit her Ksuva, they're ob obligated to bury her. So, so Abaye says, Ve'ezu Yamana Shishna Shne Yorshim. What kind of Amana has two sets of heirs? Have Yomer Zushmer Siyavam. So it must be that the Mishnah is talking about. Uh, a woman who is Shamir Siava. Now, this is a little bit strange because we just said, yisomim, there are no Yosomim here. So, uh, because she didn't have kids, that's why she has to do Yibam. So, Abaye, we'd have to say that Abaye holds that since in general, when a husband dies, we call his estate the Yorshim. In this case, we call it the Yorshim, even though it's not the literal Yorshim. Meaning it's not her children who are the Yorshim. In this case, when it says the Yorshim, the, Yo the Yosomim, it's not property of the orphans because there are no kids. It means the brother-in-law, her husband's brother. I'm a Rava, but Rava asked about this. Let the brother say, Ani Yorsh Ishto, Ain't any cover. I'll inherit my uh, him as his. Uh, I'm inherit, inheriting my brother, but I refuse to bury my, uh, to to spend the funeral and burial expenses. Why doesn't Rava have that? R Rava says that the husband doesn't have that right. So Abaye responded to Rava, because we can come at him from two different angles. As if the brother is considered the heir of his deceased brother, he has to obligate. He has to bury his wife. He may no cover his sister. You think suvasa. But if he's if he's not going to bury her, then he has to pay the suva right away. Meaning, if he's not going to pay for the suva, if, if he's not going to pay for the funeral, he has to pay to her. Heirs, whether her father's still alive or her brothers, the ksuva that's owed to her, and so then they could pay the ksuva. They're going to pay the burial out of this. But what Rav, what what Rava is, what Abaye is responding to Rava, is that either way the husband's going to pay for it because either he has to pay the funeral expenses directly, and if he refuses, he's not married. Then he has to pay the ksuva to her. So he's paying anyway. So let him just pay the ksuva. I mean, let him pay the funeral expenses, and not the ksuva. So Amar so Rava said to Abaye, Hachani Amina, this is what I mean. My brother, I am inheriting his wife. Hachani Yoresh, I am inheriting my brother. As Ishto any cover, I am not going to bury his wife. The Imishum Ksuvasa, and if you say that if I'm not burying her, I should have to pay her Ksuva. Lo nitna Ksuva legavos mechayin. A Ksuva was not given to accept while the husband's alive. So since I, even though her husband died, but because I'm alive and I, we were waiting to do Yibam, I don't have to pay Ksuva because a Ksuva is never paid from a live husband. And now that it's transferred to me, I'm a live husband, I don't have to pay the Ksuva. 
Man Shamale de Isle Midrash Ksuva. Who says that you're allowed to learn halachas from the Ksuva? Beishamai. That's Reishamai's opinion. Reishamina Lahu. The base Shamai da Amri, and we also heard Be Shamai hold Star Omid Lagavos Kazavidoma. If a star is able to be collected, it's considered uh to be already collected, even though it hasn't actually been. So Beishamai holds because she has the ksuva and it's collectible, it's as if it is uh collected. So even though it's true, the ksuva doesn't get collected from from while it's alive, but uh, the fact that she has a ksuva and it's going to be collectible, it's coll it's considered, I mean, it's not literally, in, in regard to certain halachos, it's considered as if it was already paid. Now, what's the, uh, what it means that we make a drasha from the ksuva? So, oh, so when it says that it's already considered collected, it means that she has she's considered to have the property. So the brother is saying, I'm not taking anything away from her and I didn't get it from my brother because these fields already kind of are, are waiting for her. Okay, so what meaning, what's the gesture from the tuba? So Rashi explained in Yavamos that, from a Gmarni Yavamos, that the Ksuva says so the part of the part of the ksuba says when you get married to someone else, you're going to be able to take what is written for you in this document. So this is talking about a case where. So the halacha is, is that what if uh, the husband died and the only one who knows that the husband died is the wife. So the halacha is in order to, so that there won't be a, um, an aguna problem, we let her get remarried, but we don't let her collect the ksuva because we have no other independent verification. And uh, if we would let her do the ksuva, what would happen? There might be a, 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 a rash of, of cases where the wife, you know, secretly kills her husband in order to get the ksuva. So we don't want that to happen. So, we believe her, so she's not a guna, but we don't let her get the ksuva. So the Chachamah made it only to her benefit that she doesn't get stuck as an aguna, do we believe her, but she doesn't get believed completely for the monetary situations. And right, you know, September 11th was a week ago, so uh, I mentioned that uh, once or twice that uh, in regard to people who are killed, men who are killed, on September 11th, and uh, the kids were able to sit shiva right away, but the but the wife is considered was considered aguna until a based in paskin that we have enough evidence that her husband was killed. So it's a very strange case where the the where the kids were sitting shiva, and the and the and the wives weren't allowed to sit shiva yet. They they were the real the the classic case of aguna. We don't know what happened to the husband, but in regard to the children. There was enough evidence to consider that their that their father died, but at that point, at the beginning, it wasn't sure enough that the that the that her, that he, as her husband, is that is died. So she was not good until that was clarified. So it's a bit of a of of a unique case, but it's but uh, that's Allah. The problem with October, so so in general, when something, a calamity happens, you could either be dead or you could use the confusion to run away. And so when when Rabbi Rakefet, uh was one of a group who re-looked into, I think, Yaakov Katz, who was missing from Sultan Jacob in 1982 in Lebanon, they have no evidence that he was killed or what, or seized or whatever. So maybe he was alive. So from October 7th, um, we know that people were kidnapped and they had to figure out who was kidnapped, who was alive, and who was killed. And it took them months and months of nonstop work to identify all these bone fragments and 
and also the people they said there were some people who were you know tied together and and the, the fire was so hot the bones melted together so they had to really go through everything to see how many people were in there that and things like that really really horrible 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 things um i guess there would have been i guess potentially there could have been well let's put it this way a few weeks ago they found a few bodies of 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 elderly men in their 70s and 80s who were killed so until then they weren't sure they were dead so if their wives were alive or the kids were they, they wouldn't say shiva because they didn't know that there was enough evidence that they were dead so no one would have said shiva yet but then at that time the and and they had enough body you know they had forensic evidence that they were dead so they'd be dead for the i don't think there's any difference in time for the any children versus the wife now uh, Rav, uh, Rav david lao said he had, he had to do a lot of uh, of um of halitzas a lot of of uh the, some of the men who were killed they were married and they didn't have any children so they had to do halitza a bunch of times a, a bunch of cases of halitza i read that somewhere that he had to do a lot of chalitzas. Let me say a lot, even five is a lot. But I think because of the situation, I mean to to make sure that I, that your answer is is your question has a clear answer. I think that the problem is is that there wasn't there it couldn't be assumed that people were killed because we know that people were taken alive. Whereas in the World Trade Center, they didn't find any survivors in the rubble. You know that if we were in there, you were dead. So that's the difference. So that's why I think that the cases were not that similar in regard to the. Because so once they found evidence that someone was dead, that was the first evidence that they had for any relatives, not just a wife. Well, yeah, that doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it would be kids or a wife. Uh, I mean, uh, Either so you're established that the people weren't missing indeed and that they had gone to work that day i mean you couldn't establish 100 percent that people were in the building right so right so so they it, uh we have a book here uh about it where they where they the base didn't listen to experts about how the cell phone works and i mean not everyone had cell phones there but some people called and they told their wives were here the building they right. they had the and some people they didn't but they had their cell phones that they we're in the thing. Some people, if I mean, I heard a story now from 23 years ago, whatever, that someone, the son was misbehaving. And so they had to go to the school to, to for the principal to yell at them. And because of that, they didn't go to the World Trade Center. And so they were on their way, but it's everything stopped and they survived because of that. Maybe my father said a couple of days ago in the morning board or something. I didn't see that, but I, but I heard some. So, I mean, some people could have, there were, I remember right at the time, a few weeks later, some people who people thought were dead were alive. They went on vacation on September 10th and their their neighbors or friends knew that they worked on there, but they didn't know they're going on vacation and they didn't see them. And they, they assumed they dead, but they were dead, but they had been out of the country or they were out of town and they were fine. So, you know, so, so that's why you can't just assume they're dead. You have to know that they're actually there and and. Stuff, but I mean that they worked for years and they to, to get DNA for every person from the World Trade Center. My my uh, my uncle uh, from here knew a guy whose sister they had a family who had rest restaurants, so the sister worked at the the restaurant on the top floor. So they found DNA from her very soon in October already. I remember I was either putting up the sukkah, I was probably taking down the sukkah, and he and my uncle came and said. That this guy he knows his sister they found her DNA, you know, because she was at the very top of the tower. So and it falls out that was one of the earliest things they got to. But for people who are 
with the other stuff, all these other stories on top of them, it took months and months and months, if not a year or two, even for them to find DNA. It's not. So how do we know this halacha? That uh, that she already, because she has a ksuva, it's as if some land is, uh, is some of the property is already ready for her. So this is in regard to a sota. So a woman whose husband had warned her not to be alone with so-and-so and she didn't listen. But before she actually had the sota ceremony where she drank the water, the husband died. What's the ha what's the status? Beishamai omrim not los ksuvas v'lo shosos. Beishamai says they take they get their ksuva but they don't drink. Now if she would have been guilty, she would she wouldn't get her ksuva anymore. They'd get divorced and she loses her ksuva because of her bad behavior. So Beishamai says she gets to keep her ksuva and she doesn't have to drink. Beisol omrim o shosos o lo no o ksuva. She could either drink and if she's innocent she gets to keep keep her ksuva or if she refuses to drink she's not going to get the ksuva. So the Gemara asks, oh, Shoso, she has an opportunity, she can choose to drink. The Pasuk says in Parshas Nal, so the man will bring his wife to the Kohen and then she'll drink. In this case, because the husband's dead, he's not able to bring her. So it's not possible that she could drink. Hagabe Shavai says she has a choice to drink. says because she's not able to drink, she does not get her ksuba. Beishamai Omer and Beishamai says, no los kuzos of loshos. So she takes her ksuva and she doesn't drink the bitter waters. Ba'amai, why does she get her ksuva? Sfeikahi, it's a doubt. Savig z'nai, savig lo z'nai. It's, uh, it's a doubt whether she acted improperly, in which case she wouldn't get the ksuva, or maybe she didn't, in which case she would keep the ksuva. Because he safik umotimi de'ivadai, yet the safik, the doubt of maybe she was acted improperly, immorally, that could take away the vadai, the, the certainty that... Uh, that she's going to get her ksuva. So we see that from the, the phrase that that uh, about this about the suffix about there being a doubt, we see kasavri beishamai shtar homi legavos kagavoy damai that beishamai holds that the star that's going to be collected is already considered collected, and therefore even though she maybe would have lost her ksuva because she acted improperly and became a suspected woman, uh, she gets to keep the ksuva. So we see that because uh, she has a star. So land that's pledged towards as if it's already it's already collectible. So she's able to collect the uh, the ksuva um, be, because she's not able to drink because her husband died before then. So she she gets to keep the ksuva. So we're out of time here.